All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Daryl Williams, who is a member of the White House Communications Agency Hall of Fame. Daryl, how you doing? I'm doing great, Tim. Good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. It's great to have you. And we'd <clears> like <throat> to jump right in. So if you could start with just telling us a little bit more about yourself, what you'd like to do for fun, that'd be great. So a little bit about me. I'm a retired a military veteran in the Army for about 20 years. Uh, grew up in Compton, California, right? So everybody that knows the movie Boys in the Hood, that was the yep. industry time that I grew up in and my uh, brothers and sister grew up doing straight out of Compton. So definitely a little crazy times there, but um, just had to figure out, hey, it's got to be a bit different way to do things. So I ended up joining the military and kind of never looked back. I was very fortunate to have a bunch of special assignments. And one of those with the White House Communication Agency, as you mentioned i'll talk a little bit more about that later learned a lot traveled a lot worked for three presidents right three vice presidents uh traveled on air force two i mean just i've, I've had a very fortunate life which is why i'm kind of committed to giving back and things i do for fun man love fantasy football the trash talking the strategy <laughs> uh love walking with my wife and then definitely movies. I'm a big movie buff. Um, I always look for kind of like those little leadership lessons from different movies. Really? Leadership lessons from movies? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I just had a guy on my podcast, like, probably five or six episodes ago. I listened to him this morning. Did you? <laughs> I did. <laughs> that was a great show, man. You do a really good job. Hey, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah, man. If you want me to connect you to, I don't know if there would be anything there worth talking about, but even if you guys are just both leadership guys for movies, that'd be that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw something on him a while back on the internet. That's why when I looked through your episode, I was like, oh, let me see. You know, I was like, oh, I remember seeing this guy. Uh, that was a great show. Really good yeah. show. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's cool, man. Okay, so retired military veteran, and how long have you been retired? So I retired back in 2004, gotcha. and from there I started teaching um, at a leadership academy. Uh, so I did that for about, I guess, about six years. And then about 2010, I went back to work for the federal government uh, doing military uh, human resources. But most of my time, it's really just um, anything I do, whether within the government and in my spare time, it still revolves around uh, coaching people and uh, training. I got you. I got you. Okay. And so big movie buff, what are some of your, your favorite movies, the top notch movies for you that have the best leadership lessons that you can tell you go to? Tim, my number one is Major Pain. Oh my gosh. I love Major Pain. That movie is so amazing because it, it seems like it's funny, but the key is it's really true. I actually went to an organization and it was kind of the team wasn't together. And I'm like, man, these guys are so talented and like, what's going on here? So I started interviewing the customers and the leaders over me. And it was so funny when I started putting everything together, I was like, I need to take a major pain leadership approach. I need to be so tough on them that they will hate me more than they hate themselves. And they will come together. And I'm telling you, Tim, that's exactly what happened. And um, to this day, um, a couple of them have transferred out, but the team is still just as tight as it could be, all because of major pain. Oh, that's epic. <laughs> it's true. Very true story. <laughs> have you seen um, Have you seen Ted Lasso? I have not. I heard about it, but I have not. Very similar. He, he did that in one episode. He was like, oh, I have to be a horrible coach so the, the players band together. And so you're right. It's a very, very key leadership principle. Um, love it, man. Well, cool. Tell us a bit more about your motivation. What really gets you up and keeps you going nowadays? It is so easy. Um, for me, man, I just love uh, using my gifts to help other people. Mm. I I did not realize how blessed I was when I was in the military. I mean, we see leadership every day. We get leadership training for every rank that we make. And then once I got out of the military and went back working for the government. And then start working with a lot of other different churches because I'll just be a youth pastor as well, you know, helping kids again, trying to give back. And it just shocked me like, oh, man, these people are missing leadership. 
It's like if they had a little bit of leadership, man, they could accomplish some things. So, you know, one of my mantras is, you know, that's not a problem that can be solved with uh, our good leadership. And my motivation is, you know, when I work every day, it's like, who am I going to meet? What situation am I going to be in? Um, what's going to happen today where I can just motivate somebody using my gifts to help them accomplish a goal? And that motivates me because it never runs dry. There's always somebody new. And um, it's, it's something about when you can, um, you know, have selfless service type of mentality. Like that never gets old. I got you. And so tell us a little bit about, we heard about one of the leadership concepts that you've tapped into over, um, you know, over your experience, but tell us about some of the other core tenets of leadership for you. For me, it's really just living out, you know, my army values. I mean, people are like, man, why do you still live like that? I mean, you've been out of the army for years, but I found that it just works, man. Um, the kind of acronym is leadership, but it's loyalty, discipline, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And I guarantee that any great leader that's doing good things, that's leading great teams, um, there's an aspect of one of those that's very prevalent um, in their everyday approach. And I use that, you know, with my kids, with my wife. You know, anybody I come in contact with, like if I'm loyal, right, they're going to know that they can trust me. If I have discipline, they know I'm going to show up every day when they need me, right? The respect, never going to talk down to somebody because they have some challenges. The selfless service, it's never about me, it's about somebody else, right? The honor, like I take pride in what I do when it comes to helping people. Um, integrity, man, people need to know that there's still people out there to have integrity. It's like, it's not about money. It's not about trying to take advantage of you. It's like, I just have a genuine desire to see you accomplish your goals. And then there's that personal courage, you know, sharing people like, hey, I wasn't always like this, right? Uh, you couldn't get me to repel out of a helicopter when I was growing up in Compton. But now when you start doing those things and facing those fears, you're like, okay, what else can I accomplish? Yeah. I love it. And is that LDR SHIP? That's it. Yeah. I, I was looking it up because I was like, hold up. Letters aren't <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. That's the army for you, Tim, man. We kind of break it down and some stuff is like all acronym based. But yeah, yeah you're right. It's LDR SHIP. That's exactly how they do it. Yeah. There we go, man. There we go. That's awesome. And so is that what you learn in the Army day one, or do you have to get to a certain level of leadership in the Army before they start teaching that to you? Great question. So uh, when I was there, we didn't learn that day one, but that's something that you learn over time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the main thing you learned day one was, was pretty much uh, just the basic things, um, just to make you a better person and a better team player. Uh, one thing I loved about the Army, man, the first thing they do, and you heard this before, is you go in there, they break you down, right? It's like, I'm Tim, I'm, I'm from, you know, I'm from Texas or whatever. I, I know what I'm doing here. And it's like, yeah, you might be great, but we're going to break you down. And then they're going to build you back up with the right type of personality traits that's more team-oriented. A lot of times when people join the military, you know, we're all individualists, right? And one thing I loved about basic training was, it breaks you down from the individual piece. Still keep those things that make you strong, but then it's like, how do you blend that to be a better, we call it a battle buddy, right? A lot of things in basic training, they'll pair me up. I'm from Compton. Let's just say you're from North Carolina. So I'm the city boy, you're the country boy. And they'll pair you together. You're like, why didn't you pair me up with Detroit? Because in the military, they call you by your city name, right? That's your nickname. Yeah. Like, why do you put me up with Detroit or New York? It's like, no, nope, you can be with North Carolina. And every time I see y'all, y'all better be together, right? And it's kind of like, and what they're teaching you is you don't leave somebody behind. Like wherever you go, that person needs to go. They're not in formation. You better not show up in formation. Both of you better be on time or both of you better be late. And just teaching you that concept, it allows you to realize there's something bigger than me. Mm. And I love that. I love that because I've seen it outside of the military. Those values can still work. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I've always been, um, I'll get to that a little bit later. Okay. I'm, I'm curious which, um, 
which of those in leadership were the most difficult for you to develop? That's a good one. I think one of the challenges was probably the personal courage. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, like for me, when I first went to the military, it was so funny. I remember we went to the rifle range, right? Everybody has to qualify their rifle. And Tim, I couldn't do it. I kept bowling, man. I wasn't, I mean, I went through all the training. I, I got the breathing piece. I just couldn't get it. <clears throat> So I started getting a little nervous, like, man, I cannot go back on the block. I already had a couple of boys like, yeah, man, you're not going to make it in the Army, so we'll see you back here in a couple of weeks. Because, you know, when I left, you know, I was really small, you know, and I just kept thinking to myself, like, man, I can't go back. I, I'm letting my family down, letting my community down, letting my church down. Like, come on, get this together. So the personal courage piece was really big in the beginning. It was like, man, how do I overcome this fear of, and it wasn't like I was scared of the weapon. I was doing everything right. I just couldn't put all the techniques together. Yeah. But, but one thing I loved about the Army, man, like if you're good at something, you will become like that unofficial subject matter expert or that SME. And they had this tent where they were like, okay, everybody that did not qualify, go over to that tent. And you're thinking like, oh, man, they're going to read me the riot act. You know, they're going to talk about me. But it was the opposite. They had like the top four scores from our um particular platoon they kind of had this train the trainer effect so it wasn't just a drill sergeant they had you know like if timmy if you did good and you got 40 out of 40 and now we're going to let you teach Darrell, right and we went through the training with those individuals then we would go back out and re-qualify and once i did that and i qualified i was like man what an amazing concept like they didn't give up on you they didn't you know like you all see the tv they're all in your face and all that that wasn't the case. In that situation, they knew, like, this person just needs extra training. So once I got through that, and my personal courage really just shot up. It's like, okay, you can't be afraid to make mistakes. Know that you can bounce back from mistakes. And know that your mistake is going to help somebody else in the future. Mm. I love it. I love it. So they're really not just all screaming in your face like that, telling you mm. you're a failure. They're really not, man. They just do that in the very beginning just to kind of get your attention and, again, break down that individualistic barrier. And then also the other thing people told me before I even went in, which is true, too, was it's all about mental toughness. Um, anything that anybody wants to do in life, and you've seen this before, it's not about the strongest, it's not about the fastest, but it's really about those who are mentally tough. If you're mentally tough, you really can make it through anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I've always been... um curious about how the army transforms people so quickly like they'll take a rug rat or like a hoodlum and then they'll yes. make him like straight up ready for war yes in like 12 weeks or something crazy like that you're absolutely right <laughs> yeah and so it's always been i always love hearing about that uh the beginning process for the army because i just think it's amazing and then i think it's funny because a lot of people go through life and they just think that they cannot develop themselves or that they're not able to become something better. And I'm like, do you not see that the military is literally taking these 18 year old boys where nobody would bet anything on them and makes them somebody that like, basically the freedom of our country is like dependent on them performing. Right. And so, um, yeah, man, I just love the army. I love studying it and hearing about like, yes. Um, but veterans talk about the process. It's, and, it's amazing. And, and it's funny you say that, Timmy. I was telling somebody the other day, they were like, you know, what are some of their you know, fondest moments, you know, early life in the military? And even before diversity and all that became a thing, man, I would tell them the first couple of nights in boot camp where you're in this room and you got, you know, six, eight, 12 guys, different parts of the country, right? Got people from the country, the city, and, you know, it was real, Tim. You know, they're like, hey, man, this is my first time. Well, you know us, but we'll start the conversation. Like, yo, I bet this is the first time you've been in a room, in a room with a black person, right? Yeah. And then a, the then white guy would be like, oh, man, why are you trying to go there? It's like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. But then they would open up like, hey, this actually, you're the first black guy I ever been around. And what was so cool, Tim, was we would start talking about things that were different, things that we've heard, 
right? But all the stereotypes, we just put it all out there. Like, oh man, so yeah. is it true? Everybody in the country can ride a horse. It's like, no, man, where do you get that from? <laughs> you know, and then they'll ask us, you know, is it true that everybody in the city can shoot a gun? It's like, no, man, where do you yeah. get that from? And what was so great about it, Tim, was we, we addressed the stereotypes head on and talked about all that, kind of debunked all the myths. And then we started getting like, okay, so Tim, so tell me what, you, you know, what was life like in Texas? And then we started hearing everybody's like these similar stories. My mom died, my dad died. My mom cheated on my dad. My dad cheated on my, like, I had to raise my brothers and sisters on my own. You no, know, so everybody, even though we were from different parts of the country, there was something that we had in common. Yep. Some type of struggle, some type of expectation. I mean, we had some guys, Tim, they were like, I mean, their family was rich. Yep. And we were, and we were like, dude, why are you in the army? Uh -huh. And they were like, I didn't want to live off of my parents' money. I wanted to make it on my own. I wanted to lead the bougie life. I wanted to know what regular people, how regular people live. So you like, we got mad respect for people like that. Instead of like, uh, you know, being jealous because they got money. It's like, man, that's all right. You know, you're yeah. all right. And those nightly talks, Tim, I'm telling you, it really brought us together because again, we didn't need the drill sergeants to keep telling us, you know, Tim, you're not going to pass unless you bring Darrell with you or, you know, you better know your battle buddy. It's like the environment that they put you in automatically leads you to getting to know your uh, individual better. That's why I love that scene in the movie with um, Remember the Titans when he gives them the different roommates and he's saying, yep. you come to dinner, you better know, you know, something about your roommate. Like that's a military philosophy, man. I got to know something about my battle buddy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Do you think society could benefit from having any of those principles applied to our daily lives and do you see a way where it could realistically happen because i feel like our life you know is so individualistic yeah in our daily lives now but we also all kind of long for community and so have you ever thought about how we could take some of those principles and apply them into our daily lives without interrupting our daily life in a real drastic way Absolutely. I'm totally 100% with you on that. We can definitely do that. That's why when I talk at uh, leadership conferences or things like that, and people are like, well, Darrell, it's easy for you because you were in the military. They had to do what you say. So those principles work. But I had to tell them, though, and debunk that myth is just because you're in the military and you have rank, just because I tell Tim what to do, it doesn't mean he's going to do it to his best ability. Mm -hmm. And that's what they don't realize. Leadership is not about rank or position. It's about how you motivate somebody to do their best. So using those principles was the difference between Tim just showing up and just giving me a C effort. And then Tim showing up and like, man, I'll run through the wall for Darrell, man. That dude got my back. Um, I love what he stands for. He never takes credit for the good stuff. He always says it was me. And then when it's something bad or a mistake, he says it was his fault. Like those types of principles are transferable in any industry. And to your point, I do believe that we can use that. And that's why I like, you know, companies that, you know, hire veterans or bring in veterans or when you have veterans kind of spread throughout the community, whether they're a teacher or a coach, I think those are the different small ways that those values are making their way through society. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Well, cool, Darrell. Let's go ahead and jump into your dreams and goals. Tell us about your vision for your life and your career. Well, I'm really biggest dream, really, man, is I just want to exhaust all my gifts and just be a blessing to others. Um, I was kind of selfish, man. When I was in the military, to the point where I just thought everybody, right, was doing their best and bringing out their best. And it wasn't until I got out of the military, I was like, man, there are some people who feel like life has dealt them a bad hand. They can never get promoted. Um, I don't look like everybody else, so I'll never get, you know, my fair share. And I was like, man, I have to break down these myths for these people and let them know that, yes, sometimes you are dealt a bad hand, but, you know, you got to treat life like a game of spades. This is the hand I was dealt. All right. How many cuts can I get? You know, how many of uh -huh. these, you know, can I make happen? Hey, I, I got a partner over there. Maybe I need to stop doing life by myself. And trust my partner, right? Yep. 
So I'm trying to let people know that, you know, there's different ways that you can still achieve your definition of success, whatever that is, whether you want to be a great mom or a great husband, right, or, you know, whatever it is. And for me, my role is, or my dream is, if I can use my gift to help that person get to whatever that is, I'm good, man. Because people are like, oh, damn, but isn't there something else you want to do? I'm like, man, you got to understand, when you grow up in Compton, California, right, going through the 80s, and I end up retiring, and one of my last assignments was flying on Air Force Two with Vice President Dick Cheney. It's like, th there is nothing else <laughs> out yeah. there. You know what I'm saying? And then on top of that, years later, like, oh, um, you've been uh, selected to be inducted into the Hall of Fame of the White House Communication Agency. Like, wait a minute, this organization started back in the freaking 60s. Uh -huh. And you're telling me that I'm one of the best to ever do it. It was like, no, nah, man, I can't just sit on that. I, I got to use whatever got me to be elected to the Hall of Fame. And how can I share those principles with somebody else? So that's really my dream, man. I really help people and I love helping them. And, you know, I love getting the emails from people saying, hey, you know, after our last coaching session, I did what you said. I thought, oh, no, no, it's not what I said. It's what you agreed to do. A coach never tells you what to do. I just ask you the questions and, you know, you figure it out in yourself. And then they'll say, okay, um, I did the things that came up out of our discussion and I got that promotion. And man, that, and people don't realize, man, the adrenaline that you can get when you help somebody, right? That's why when you look at sports and you know different people that receive things and they all, you know, they think their mom or dad and they always think that other person that really believed in them, that helped them. That's a powerful thing. And uh, what I love about it, Tim, is that's something that can continue um, receiving dividends, right? There's a return on investment when you help somebody because like in one of your show, you were asking the guy like, you know, how many leads does he want to create? Right, hundred thousand times a hundred thousand. Like that's that same principle, man. Like, man, if I just help five people to accomplish what they need, big or small, and then they go tell their story. Well, this is how Tim helped me. I don't know if it can help you, but here's what I had to do. Here's what I had to change. So when I do that, man, just using my gifts to bless other people, um, that's that's the best dream that I can have, and I get to live that dream every day. Mm. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome. I love when people realize that service is the best way to fulfillment. And um, it sounds like you, you're right there on that. And you get that, um, you know, jolt of excitement of fulfillment from helping people out, which is key, man. It's key. And I like what you said on that, because people don't realize they're like, well, I don't really have that. I'm like, yes, you do. Think about those people that are parents. Like they had dreams and wanted to do some things, but I almost think about most parents will tell you their biggest joy is when they see their son or daughter accomplish something. Yep. Even if the small thing, the first time they learn how to ride a bike or the first time they do anything, right? So we all have that in us. Even if you're not a parent, right? You have a, a, a nephew or niece or you know, just somebody like, man, that person doesn't have a father. You know what? I'm going to help him play catch with this kid in the neighborhood. We all have that. And they come back, you help somebody, you say with their math homework, and they come back and say, Tim, Tim, I got an A on that test. You feel so great for that other person that you rarely say in the heat of the moment, well, you know you got that A because I helped you. You don't, that yeah. doesn't even come to your mind, right, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> your natural instinct is, I knew you can do it. I'm proud of you. You know, let that be a stepping stone. Remember this day. And this, so I say that to say that that's inside of all of us. We just have to take the time to nurture it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Well, this might be a, a strange couple questions for you, but no, I'm no, curious. Uh, what are the top one to two skills that you feel you need to develop to continue using your gifts and further using your gifts to help people achieve their definition of success? Uh, definitely my discipline and my self service without a doubt, <clears throat> because people think of you in the military, like, well, discipline is easy for you. You know, you had it like, man, discipline is something you got to work on every day. I think I heard a uh, sports person say, you know, rent is due every day. Like that's how, yeah. that's how discipline is, man. Discipline is due every day, even on your day off. It's like I might not do what I'm was uh, had to do, but there's still a little bit that I still have to do. 
Uh-huh. Right. And that's what discipline is. So for me, man, I always got to work on my discipline because, man, you can get into a rut. And next thing you know, it's like, man, it's been five days since I did X. I got to get back on track. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the other skill is that selfless service, man. It's so easy for people that have accomplished things to pump themselves up, get caught up in, you know, Tim got that podcast because I introduced him to so-and-so. It's like, no, 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 no. Tim got that podcast because he was destined to get it. You may have had a little bit to do with it, but that's not why Tim is successful. So to have that selfless service mentality, you have to, like, you kind of squash it every day. It's like, don't let that ego uh, get in the way because once the ego gets in the way, I believe you're not going to accomplish as much as you're supposed to while you're on this earth. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Tell us a little bit about discipline and how after a five-day slump, you reset your discipline and rebuild that consistency. Yeah, because sometimes, Tim, and I always tell people, <clears throat> give yourself grace. We really beat ourselves up too much sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, who said you have to put out five shows a week? Well, that's what I've been doing. Yeah, but it's okay if you go on a vacation, you go on a wedding, and you put out three shows that week. Give yourself, you know, so cut yourself yeah. some slack. It's okay. You're still a great podcast guest. People are not going to say, oh, I'm going to stop listening to Tim because instead of putting out five shows a week, he only put out three that week. Oh, uh -huh. man. <laughs> They're just going to appreciate your efforts. And that's yeah. what I tell people. So, again, for the discipline, please, you know, again, it's just about, okay, this is my normal routine. This is what I like to do. This is my motivation. And, you know, some people, they got different things. Some people meditate in the morning. Some people do yoga, right? Some people like to run, walk, um, whatever it is. You know, everybody has something that gets them going. And if you realize, like, man, I don't feel like myself, I would say, just look back to your normal daily routines. And you may like, oh, you know what? I used to get up every morning and read the, a scripture from the Bible, but I found out my last three mornings because I worked late, I didn't read those scriptures, right? So it's okay. It's You can always get back on track. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing I do with that too, Tim, I always tell people, it's always good to have an accountability partner, right? If you're married, it's kind of easy. It can be your spouse or your partner, but then also it can be your best friend. It can be your brother, your sister, like, you know, communicate with, sometimes Tim, we do this. I don't want to tell somebody that I'm doing this because when I don't do it, right, they're going to call me fake, phony, or whatever. Yep. But it's the opposite, Tim. If you say, hey, I'm going on vacation, I'm going to this wedding. However, I still want to do my one-mile walk. Can you just send me a text, right, at 6 o'clock to say, hey, Tim, don't forget, man, you want to do your one-mile walk? Like, having an accountability partner can really help you get back on track to whatever your discipline routine is. Hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And you can do it in little ways. And I think the, the more you um, mesh that accountability partner with the activity, the mm -hmm. more they're going to be able to hold you accountable. Like, for example, I got up and my wife was still sleeping in bed right mm -hmm. before this podcast. And I was like, babe, I, I got to show up for the podcast. <laughs> like Darrell's waiting for me. <laughs> right. Right. And, and so if it had been some individual recordings, you know, I could have been like, okay, I'll push it back an hour, push back an hour and a half. Then the day gets going. And then it's like, oh, well now I have posted the podcast or I haven't recorded the podcast. And so it's just something to think about of like, the more you can intertwine that accountability partner with the activity where it's like, maybe they're waiting on you to show up to start much like the battle buddies. Right. Like, Absolutely. Y'all are late Absolutely. together. Y'all are on time together. Mm -hmm. All that. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right about that. Like today, we, th we thought we had a parent-teacher conference with the school. So my wife was supposed to take off yesterday and I was going to take off this morning. And we found out it was a false alarm. Uh, there's no more conferences, you know. And my first thought was, well, okay, I'm going to go back to work on Friday. And then my wife was like, why don't we just take the day off? It's like, Damn, I did not think about that, right? Yeah. So again, like today, she's sleeping in. I'm kind of sleeping in because I still get up at five. And it's like, wait, I got this podcast today. So it was like, we're going to go down to D.C. We're going to have some fun. But like you said, you know, I got to get on with Tim at um, eight. You know, it's only going to take about an hour. You know, we're going to push that back to nine instead of starting at eight. But like you said, like, hey, I got to be there for Tim. I want to make sure that whatever his guests get out of this episode, you know, I want to be helpful to that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So that accountability partner and the grace. So I heard yes. three things. I heard doing something that you can you could be consistent with in the sense that you like it. You don't mind mm-hmm. showing up for it. And then having grace for yourself when you don't show up and getting an accountability partner. Right? Absolutely. Those things have helped me throughout um, military and post-military career. They really have. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to approach discipline in general, especially I like this is something I wish somebody would have told me earlier, but just like it's OK to do something at a smaller scale so that you can do it consistently as opposed to trying to do too much too fast and then burning out in two weeks. Like my 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year old mind could not comprehend that. And then as I'm getting out of call, just like, no, it'd be better. Like, yeah, I'm posting a daily podcast, but every episode doesn't have to be 50 minutes. Like you'll see, Boom. sometimes I have a three minute episode on there. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. I saw that, but they were powerful though. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's like, I'm, gonna provide value still but it's gonna be in a three minute time because i know i can be consistent with that three minutes and so when i said i was gonna post a daily podcast i was like maybe the podcast will be me hopping on reading a quote and then hopping off and that's it but i'm Absolutely. posting it daily and so just something you could be consistent with is a mindset shift that i hadn't made for so long in my life and the podcast has actually helped me do that that's so. good man that's good it's so funny in the military we call that a battle rhythm Mm-hmm. Right. Where you just do something sequentially all the time on time. And a lot of people like, man, like, for example, uh, my wife, man, I'm so proud of her, man. She never used to really exercise. And now with her new job, they have these big wellness competitions where individually and as a group, you know, you get so many steps a day and you could, you know, get a little individual prizes. Not nothing big, but just something, yeah. you know, motivational. And man, she, um, was it last weekend? We walked. We walked uh, the first five k, mm-hmm. and she was like, "I would never do anything like this. I can't imagine myself doing this." I said, "Yeah, but look what you've done. You started in January just doing little things, getting little steps, right? Then you kind of increase it. Then you started walking at lunch. Then you start walking again a little bit, not nothing crazy, you know, just walk around the block, right? And then oh. you walk the opposite way around the block." But like you just said, just doing those little things on a consistent basis and then you build up to it. And next thing you know, you're like, wow, I can't believe I'm at this level or I started with one podcast and one episode and now I'm on season three. And I have to remind people, Tim, sometimes don't look at Tim's season three when you're at your season one. Yep. Right. Tim has put in so much work and did so much research and had to find the right equipment and the right platform. It was like, no, learn about Tim's process. Right. But don't hate on Tim's success. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. And it really is, man. It's crazy how much the small, consistent stuff compounds. What's even Mm -hmm. crazier is it's always working one way or the other. So stuff's either compounding positively or probably by default, if you're not being intentional, it might be compounding negatively on your behalf. And so, you know, if instead of going on a 15 minute walk every day, you choose to eat two slices of cheesecake, like that's a habit too. That takes some discipline too. There's a little bit less of a barrier to entry there, but um, yeah, stuff is compounding. When I read the compound effect and Darren Hardy was like, it's always working in your life one way or the other, Mm -hmm. just figure out which way it's working for you and then optimize it for where you want it to go. Um, It was a real good perspective shift for me. And and what's so great about that is again, there are some people that never heard that concept, but thanks to you, like they may not even, you know, run into that individual, but because of what you just said, you have helped somebody today that's going to be like, oh, wow, I never heard of that. That makes so much sense. Let me do more research on that. So again, the little things Mm -hmm. can lead to something so much bigger. Yeah, 100%. Well, cool, man. What are the highest impact daily actions that tick the needle forward for you towards using your gifts to help people get to their definition of success? Man, that is a great question. I would say... For me, it's always continuing to look for community needs that can benefit from my experience. And when I say community needs, I mean whoever's around us, 
whether it's church, whether it's school, whether it's work, right? Like who can benefit from something that I've done and not necessarily successful, right? Hey, I've made a lot of mistakes. I tell my kids it all the time. Like dad was not um, Hall of Fame his whole life. Trust me. Dad yeah. made a lot of mistakes. I said, luckily enough, the mistakes I made weren't big enough, right, to keep me from my future. Um, so I think for me, it's always just looking and being intentional. Like, man, who, again, who in the community can use my help? All right, my wife and I, we do uh, relationship coaching mm. for couples, right? When they get ready to get married, kind of walk them through uh, eight principles. And when I was sharing with one of the uh, couples last night, you know, that, you know, in the beginning, you know, man, I was kind of rough, you know, in my marriage because I was in the military. So I'm bringing all this stuff like, why is this laying around the house? What's going on with that? <laughs> Everything needs to be in its place. And, you know, my wife had to remind me like, hey, I'm, you know, you're in the army, not me. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. So I had to share that with the couple. And it's like, hey, man, don't put, you know, your things onto your wife. And for her, you know, don't push your things off onto him. You know, make sure you guys talk equally about, you know, what do we agree to disagree on? Because marriage is not about well, we're going to always agree 100% of the time. No, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Right. And you don't keep track. Oh, but well, Tim, you won that last one. So now it's my turn. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Manage expectations. Agree to disagree. Right. And um, things are going to be OK. And a lot of times it's so funny. I love when we mentor young couples because they think you're going to you know give them all these rules and stuff that you can't live by and it's like no man the, the, the greater marriages come from the mistakes and the fun you know it's yeah. not about being serious all the time because when you're serious all the time that's not going to be fun mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah so just community man just paying attention to you know what's needed in my community there we go I love it that thing with relationships I think it's really interesting, like that agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can bring it up to people and they'll be like, well, why would I compromise? Why would I mm. do something like this? And so what would you say to that person? So if they're in a relationship, um, same thing, an older guy told me, asked me a long time ago, Tim, he said, do you want to be married or do you want to be right? Yep. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Uh-huh. Like this is a guy that's been married fifty years. Yep. And I'm like, man, do you want to be married? Or do you want to be right? And I'm like, you know me too. Can I do both? He's like, yes. nope. <laughs> yep, yep. No, I got you. I like it though. I like how he went right to priorities. It's like you got to prioritize your marriage over your ego, basically. That's exactly what he was saying, Tim. You hit it right there. It was like, no, is it really that serious? It's like, you know what? It, it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. Darrell, what character trait do you most need to develop right now to continue to help people? I, I think, again, that discipline and that selfless service, because, again, it's so easy to fall behind and get lazy. And for me, as long as I can keep those two, because the other ones kind of take care of itself, the loyalty, the integrity, the honor, like that's just who I am. Yeah. But again, that discipline and that selfless service, man, the discipline because of the external factors and the selfless service because I have to keep the ego at bay. Yeah, I got you. And if there were one or two people you could meet right now, it could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help you take that next step towards your dreams and goals, towards helping people get to their idea of success. Who would that person be and how would they help you? Man, I have two fantastic mentors. I don't see them all the time. Um, but, man, th these guys, man, one guy's name is Steve Smith, and I'm going to make sure I send him a copy of this podcast. And the other one is uh, Jake Simmons. Yep. Um, one of them is a former colonel um, in the Army. The other one is a former warrant officer. And, man, these two guys, Tim, they were so great at leadership. Like, if I wrote a book about leadership, like I probably have two separate chapters about these two guys because just the way they flow, the way they ask you questions, uh, I don't get to see them as often, right? So every time I see them, it's like a special treat. Like somebody would say, man, meeting President Clinton would be cool or meeting, you know, President yeah. Barack Obama would be great. Like for, for me, 
Like I, I didn't meet Obama, I got out before that, but you know, I met President Clinton, I met President Bush Jr., Bush Sr. But meeting those two guys, like if you said, like, hey man, it's a more day weekend and I got a ticket, you know, we want to go, like, hey man, I need to go to Colorado. I would love to go to Colorado and spend some time with Mr. Smith. Yeah. Like he is just that quintessential leader that makes you think like you can do anything, man. And and um uh, Steve Smith be the guy, and then Jake Simmons, man. You know, you always see on TV or you know you hear about those guys that have those great grandfathers. Like, man, they just exude wisdom. Yeah, All right. That's Jake Simmons, man. He's not a grandfather or anything like that, but just the way he talks, the questions that he asks you, you're like, wow. Like, man, I can't let that dude down, man. It's like he is so. Um, just the stuff that he's done in his past, but he won't even talk about that. He's like, Tim, tell me about your podcast. Yeah. Like, you know, what do you like? What do you like about it? Who are you helping? And you're like, wait a minute. How do we go from talking about him? And then he's talking, asking me about what I do. Like, that's the type of leader both of those gentlemen are. So if I could ever just always sit down with a C Smith or a Jake Simmons, man, uh, that means the world to me. I gotcha. I noticed you talked about how they both ask really great questions can you talk to us a bit about crafting a good question or what are good questions focused on? Does that question make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And this is one thing I try to share with leaders. Uh, the, the, the best questions that we can ask individuals are one open-ended questions, right? Even in my regular day life, like I try my best, like a personal pet peeve. Don't ask any questions that could be yes or no. Because yeah. it doesn't cause people to think. Yep. Right. And I had to learn this even as a parent, right? My son kind of fell behind in some of his classwork. And, you know, I had to go from, you know, why'd you fall behind? Right. Because what am I going to get? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right. So now I had to go back to now that you fell behind, what are some steps you can take to get back on track? Because obviously this is unacceptable in this household. <laughs> Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> right. So now I'm putting steps there. So now he's like, well, I guess I can go see my teacher. I go see my counselor. He's coming up with the answers. Right. Um, and then even though when I'm talking to a husband, I'm doing coaching. Right. Instead of saying, you know, um, you know, did you really mean to holler at your wife like that? Yes. <laughs> it was like, okay, <laughs> let me go back to change the question. Now that you hollered at your wife and things are not going well, what do you think you need to do to make things right? Mm -hmm. Again, now I'm making him think. He's coming up with the answer and it's not me telling him what to do. So I always say, you know, asking the open-ended questions um, can really help in almost any situation, Tim, whether it's work, relationships, parenting, friendship. You know, it's, it's a power to come with open-ended questions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Well, now we're going to jump into our thriving three. Okay. What is your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. Is Major Pain still? So Major Pain is the favorite movie. So I already hit that one. So I'm going to get yep. already something different. Favorite book is Who Moved My Cheese? Oh. People, you know, you see different players. And they're like, oh, man, that's the most underrated player. You know, nobody talks about Tim Duncan and all that type of stuff. Who Moved My Cheese is the most underrated book out there, man. People are like, oh, man, but isn't that a kid book? It's not that big. It's not written by John Maxwell. No, no. Who Moved My Cheese is an all-time classic. Yeah. Because, right, Rand and Skimpy, I mean, the, the principles are so ongoing. Like, the whole book is basically about change. How do you deal with change? And I don't care who you are and where you are in your life. There's always going to be change, whether I'm single or become married. Um, I have kids or I have one job. I get the new job. The change is constant. So reading the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Or I always talk to people and they're like, okay, give me a book I need to go read. I want to be a great leader. And they're looking for me to give them this book that's the size of an old school encyclopedia. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Go read Who Moved My Cheese and let's talk next month. Like that little small book? I'm like, yeah. Like they got a video now. Okay, go watch the video. I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah. But let's talk about the principles when you come back. 
And when they come back, even though it's a small book or a small video, they're like, oh my gosh, I finally got it. It was so <laughs> much in that book. Yeah. And I'm like, that's what it is. Who Moved My Cheese, man? That is a great book about change that anybody can relate to. There we go. Yeah, I've had I've had that one mentioned a couple times. I haven't gotten around to reading it, but now I've never had that synopsis, you know. You're gonna love it, Tim. You're gonna love it. There we go. Well, what is one way you like to take care of yourself? So definitely uh walking. Um, because that's one thing as a leader. A lot of times I'm um, finishing the book now by Simon Sinek about leaders eat last, which I know that whole concept from being in the military. Yep. But the other aspect of leaders eat last is sometimes leaders don't do as much for themselves as they do for everybody else. So I really had to pause and like, you know, and it was so funny, man. My daughter actually called me out one time. She was like, dad, mom's always going to do this. And, you know, you drop me off to go see my friends. You take your side to play chess and, you know, you let Joshua do this, but what do you do? And Tim, I had to look like, baby, you're right. Dad's been kind of putting myself on the back burner and I need to, you know, connect with my friends. I need to do, do my walking. So yeah. from her, from her bringing that to my uh, thought process, right? You know, I had to get back out there and do some walking. I haven't got to the running yet. I told my wife, I ran so much in the military. That's one of the things. Like, I'll probably eventually get back to it, but right <laughs> now I'm cool with walking. <laughs> uh, but that definitely has helped me out a lot. Uh, the walking, and uh, because again, it's not just the exercise, but it's just you're quiet. Right. You're not answering yeah. phones. You're not reading. I'm like, I'm not looking at my phone while I'm walking. It's I'm just walking. And I just find that to be real calming. Yeah. No audio books for you while you're walking. No podcasts. No, no audio books. No music. People are like even when I used to run, people used to like, can you run, you know, 12 minute miles and not listen to music? I'm like, I don't want anything during that time. I just want to focus on my technique and what I need to do yeah. when I get to the end. And I said, but everything is different for other people, right? Motivation. I tell people, if you need music, audiobook, by all means, do what you need to do to motivate you. But for me, you know, it's just that quietness while I'm walking. Yeah, for sure. What is one action step you can take right now or continue to take if you're already doing it to link up with Steve Smith or Jake Simmons? Uh, one thing I need to do is, man, I need to send both of them a text today before me and my wife go down to D.C., um, and just let them know, hey, I was on a podcast this morning. Uh, the topic came up about leadership and your name is always on the top of my tongue. And I just, you know, I just want to say, I don't need anything. I just want to say thank you for your friendship. Right. And I'm looking forward to catching up with you. Because that's yeah. one thing I tell people when you have mentors or coaches or however those relationships are, it's really important for the mentee to keep the relationship going. It's not about the mentor. It's about us going to them and just, you know, checking in, especially when you have older uh, mentors or people that you look up to, you think, oh man, Tim, man, he's got so many podcasts out there. He probably has all these guests calling him all the time. That might not be the case. You know, Tim may be so much into his family. Like people just think that you have all these people and then you realize, man, it would be nice if somebody would just call just every now and then just to say, hey, Tim, I'm just thinking about you, man. And had a good time on your show. Hey man, how are you doing? How's the wife? And I think we need to do that with our mentors as yeah. well. Just just do a, a, a check-in, not because you want something. I have to make that very clear. Don't talk to your mentor every time you need something. Sometimes just go to them and just say, hey, I was just thinking about you, appreciate you. And if you know texting is your thing, that's okay. Just send them a little text. Hey, just thought about you today. Appreciate the friendship. Still living off of what you told me the last time. And yeah. uh, just want just want to say thank you. So you really brought a good point today. I need to send both of them a text today. There we go. <clears throat> All right, final series of questions. You ready for them? I'm ready. What is one limiting belief that continues to pop up in your life, if any? No, it's always one. And I was thinking about this one. And one of them is um, you're not doing enough. Mm. Right. That's always one of my little things. It's like, oh, so you got on the podcast with Tim. You think you're doing something? That, that wasn't enough. That's not wow. going to reach enough people. You know, so I always have to look back and make sure I know where that's coming from. And I'm um, kind of like, you know, what's that next step to deal with that? Yeah, for sure. And 
where did that start coming from for you? Did it start in childhood, start in the military, post-military? I think it came when definitely in the military. Because once you become that first leader, then it's everything shifts in your whole life. Just like when you get married. It's not about you anymore. It's about your spouse or your partner. Yeah. So for me in the military, it was like once I became an E5 and a leader, then it's like, okay, now my focus has to be on the team and others. And every now and then I, I can do a you know 500 missions at the White House traveling with the president. Trip goes off right, right? Everything works. And then that little thing creeps up. Oh, do you think that was your best trip? What about that mistake? <laughs> right? What about that? So you have to kind of just squash that and not let that get bigger than the accomplishment. Yeah. And do you have any limiting actions that reinforce this limiting belief? Yeah. Um, I think some of it is just hearing the stories. Like mm -hmm. trips I used to do, you know, I used to do a lot of the big trips, short notice trips. And instead of somebody saying, man, I can't believe you guys, instead of 30 people going down there for Hurricane Andrew with the president, you know, you guys only went with five people, right? Mm -hmm. um, the story may come out as, yeah, I heard that you guys didn't have enough equipment on that trip. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like, ah, yeah, that's true. But I can't let that be the true narrative. It's a part of the narrative, but it's not the narrative. Yeah, I got you. And so if you were to change the limiting belief into an abundant phrase that really spoke to your heart in the way that you needed to hear it, what would that phrase be? Real easy. Every little bit counts. Mm. Every little bit counts. You have to tell yourself, regardless of what society says, regardless of even your friends or family may say, oh, Tam, you shouldn't get married. You're too young. No, no, no. Every little bit counts when it comes to how I'm going to approach my relationship, how I'm going to approach my job. Um, every little thing that I do is going to get me closer to, you know, negating that thought. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, there's this one little parable where I think there's this little boy on the beach. There are a bunch of sea stars on the beach or something like that. And they're just, they like filled the beach. They're all stuck in the sand and he's picking them up and throwing them back in the water. And some old dude comes up to him. He's like, why are you? why are you picking these things up and throwing them back in the water? You'll never be able to help them all. And then he picks one up, he throws it in. He's like, I helped that one. That's exactly <laughs> it, Tim. Yep. That's a great example of that. You have to say, you know, I'm not looking at the mass. And I think sometimes um, as leaders, as parents, right. Um, and even individuals, sometimes we let those negative beliefs um, keep us from our true destiny. Yeah. And I think sometimes, like you said earlier in the show, don't look at the big picture all the time. Just look at that one, I mean, just the next step. Yep. Right. Let me just look at that next step. Don't look at, I think I saw a quote the other day, like instead of looking at the whole staircase, just look at the next step. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, cool. When the limiting beliefs start to take over, what thoughts or actions do you resort to in order to take back control? Great question. For me, it's continuing to look at the difference that is being made. Mm. Sometimes we focus on, well, I'm not at that big point yet. I haven't hit the thing yet. I haven't wrote the book yet. But what have you done? Yeah. Right. I picked a chapter. Right. I picked a title. I picked a photo for the book. I picked a name for my podcast. Mm. Like, no, this is look at the things that you are doing and that little bit that you did different that you did make. And then just build on it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, last question for you here. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite belief about yourself? I believe that my favorite belief about myself is that outside of somebody's parents, it's not going to be too many people that's going to be as motivating as me. Mm. It's like, I always want to be like that number one cheerleader, that number one, like, Tim, you can do it, man. If you want to start a podcast, I'm telling you, you can do it. it might take a little work. It might take a little research. But man, when you do that podcast, I want to be one of your uh, guests, right? So putting that reinforcement thought back into people's mind, I, I love doing that. And that's one thing I take pride in because everybody has gifts. Everybody has skills, Right. And I think, what's that quote? It says something about people may not remember 
um, what you, um, certain what you, things about them, but they remember how how you made, you made them, feel. them feel. Yep. And I really live that. It's like, well, I want people, when they see me in the hallway, be like, man, that dude right there, he didn't even know me, but he stopped, he talked to me. Somehow I started telling him about my challenges and he set up a meeting with me and we just talked. Like, so I I, I like knowing that. Because here's the biggest thing, Tim, you notice from COVID, man, a lot of people, man, it, you know, it, it messed them up, you know, mentally, socially. So it's like, man, if I can help somebody go back to the way they were, or move to a better version of themselves that they want. You know, what what what's one small part that I can do as it relates to motivating that person? Because I know like um the love languages and the five languages of appreciation at work, like my language is words. So yeah. man, I can always send somebody a text, I can always send somebody an email, right? I can leave them a voice message. Hey man, don't need nothing from you. I just want to call you today. You was on my mind. I was on a podcast. And I just want to say whatever you're going through, hey man, hang in there. Yeah. And if I'm known as that person, I'm I'm good, right? I'm a, there's a guy who used to be in the military with me. We hadn't seen each other almost 20 years, right? And I'm seeing Mark. I'm like, hey Mark, how's it going, man? The first thing he said to him was, Darrell, how's the most positive man in the world doing? <laughs> <laughs> And we haven't seen each other in 20 years. Yeah. That's awesome. So I just, right. But I just thought, man, what a great compliment. Yeah. You know, that something that I said to this guy, he remembered, like, man, no matter how what this dude would never let me feel sorry for myself. Mm. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Darrell, man, that's all we got for you. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, you know, thanks for having me, man. I, I love your show. Like I said, I listened to the one episode today. I was like, man, he's got a great show, great title, Living a Dream. I like more people need to, you know, have that mindset. And I just hope that more people will listen to your episode because everybody, whether you admit it or not, you want to live a particular dream and you don't have to do it by yourself. You can listen to podcasts like this and kind of get that extra motivation that you need. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else that you want to chat about before we sign off here? No, I just want to encourage your listeners, right? Whoever, you know, hears this message about living the dreams, um, know that you have your own dream and just because you may not have accomplished it yet or it doesn't look the way you wanted it to look, you know, don't let that discourage you, right? As long as you're breathing, um, you have another day to either add to that dream, get closer to that dream. And here's the biggest one, help somebody else accomplish their dream. Mm. There we go. Well, awesome. Darrell, thanks so much for coming on the show. And if you guys are listening to this and you loved what Darrell had to say, make sure to check him out. All the links to do so will be down in the show notes. Thank you guys so much for watching. We will see you on the next one. And on that note, we're out.